Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll make a start. Um, the plan for the next section of, uh, of things is a little selection of book reading for your pleasure. Some of these may be novels that, uh, that you already know. Some of them may be novels that you haven't heard of or haven't actually come out yet. So um, we're going to go in a, a reading order, and there is um, a selection of, of work as well being read tomorrow. So you've got more, uh, more lovely, lovely uh, uh, fiction for your delicatation tomorrow. Um, that isn't a word. Never mind. Um, you've got more lovely fiction for you tomorrow as well, which uh, I'm sure will be a, an excellent highlight too. So today, just to, it's kind of a little bit of a wind down really, you know, we've had a long day, it's been really hot, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of panels, lots of playing of Artemis, lots of gaming, lots of Jugger, Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah and lots of, oh, so, you know. Little bit of my own back. Um, so yeah, so essentially it's a, an opportunity for you to, you know, to sort of have a relax and have a bit of a listen and maybe hear something from a book that you might be interested in. Uh, and coming up first, Michael's going to kick us off. So reading from Elite Legacy, we have Elite Executive Producer, Elite Dangerous Executive Producer, Michael Brooks. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, so I've never actually done a reading before, so I hope you'll all bear with me. I will uh, endeavour to do my best. Virgin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even at this great distance from the Artemis system's pale orange star, the light slash, the light slash sharp shadows between the asteroids hanging seeming, seemingly motionless as the small freighter passed. The once pristine white livery of the lake on Type 7 exposed its age with blemishes darkened under the harsh radiation of many suns during its long life. In contrast to its stern, almost box-like lines, the vessel moved with an easy grace through the dense cluster of asteroids. The belt had formed from the remnants of a celestial collision recent in cosmological terms, yet still long before the species which created the ship existed. The small freighter bore the name Twin Vipers, a curiously aggressive name for a ship more used to safe trade runs such as the food they delivered to the mining colony of Freehold. Like the fragments of rock around it, the name was a marker to history, albeit one of a much shorter time frame. Although the, two, the ship's two-man crew spent most of their time travelling to, uh, to and from different star systems, they considered Freehold their home. The previous, days, the previous day, Freeholm's population, including the two pilots on the ship, had celebrated two different 10-year anniversaries over the past two weeks. For the station, they celebrated their hard-fought freedom. Once the station had been a penal colony in the for the surrounding system, with the mines work worked by prisoners, most of whom were imprisoned for their opinions rather than their crimes. For the pilots now accelerating out of mass lock in the asteroid belt, it marked the end of the violence which dominated their lives and the start of something much more fulfilling. As bounty hunters, they both piloted vipers and hunted pirates and other criminals along the borders of Imperial space. The lines on their faces reflected the hard life and many battles they'd survived. Those lines had softened somewhat since their decision to retire from the life of hunting bounties. Free home held the distinction of being their first trade run. Being so soon after the rebellion, they'd made a tidy profit, although at some considerable risk. At the station, they'd also found a home, one that welcomed them, and they returned there whenever they could. A circumstance which benefited them, as over the years, they became favoured traders. As such, they enjoyed significant discounts when purchasing the refined ores and minerals the station produced. On this run, they filled the cargo hold with some of the more exotic minerals. They could have made a quick but more modest profit by transporting the minerals sorry, the materials to the populated planet Lafriel, which orbited nearer to the star. By travelling to more distant systems, they stood to make a larger profit. That would come in handy as they discussed trading in the Type 7 and upgraded to a Type 9, and that required a lot of credits. We're approaching the end of the belt, Darius, the elder of the partnership reported. Not that much separated the two in age. Both him and Simeon possessed the same lean physiques, ideal for and born from a life inside a cockpit. Nothing on the scanner, Simeon replied. I'm not surprised. I expect everyone's still sleeping off last night's celebrations. I would have minded a bit more time in bed myself. You were putting that Lavian brandy away a bit last night. Do you realize how much that stuff costs? I thought we were supposed to be saving up for a new ship. 
Simeon at least had the decency to look a little guilty, even if he didn't feel it. You have to let your hair down sometimes, you know. I've no problem with that, but the bar bill was a bit much. Nag, nag, you sound like an old woman sometimes, and besides, I didn't hear you complaining when we returned to our quarters. Darius reddened. They'd been together for almost 10 years, and he hadn't overcome his embarrassment when talking about sex, even when it was just the two of them. He'd been raised with the attitude of what happens on ship stays on ship, an attitude that remained common in certain parts of human space despite all the passing centuries. I'll admit you were a little athletic, Darius coughed, and then changed the subject. I've locked in the first jump to Capophonesis. Once we're clear of the belt, we'll jump. We should be clear in a few minutes. And anyway, I wasn't the only one being a bit over the top last night. What was all that with you and Julia? It was only a joke. She laughed, didn't she? She did, but her father didn't. You know how protective he can be. We really don't want to piss off the head of security. He was there. Oh, yes. Oops. Oops, indeed. Wait a minute. What was that? What? I'm not sure. I thought I saw something on the edge of scanner range. But if that's far out, we should be OK. We'll be jumping in a minute. Simeon kept an eye on the scanner. With Darius flying the ship, he didn't really have much else to do. There wasn't often traffic out here. Maybe the odd trader like them heading to or from free home. Occasionally he saw a Lafrian Navy patrol, but usually it was quiet. The momentary contact worried him, or maybe the Lavian brandy still fogged his thoughts. A hot breakfast had helped, but his head still ached. There it was again, a brief burst of heat, enough to register for a moment on the scanner, not enough to resolve into an identified target, though. There's something out there, and they're trying to keep quiet about it. Barrett glanced at the scanner and saw nothing. He trusted Simeon's in instincts, though. We're clearing the belt now, so we should be able to jump at any moment. Let's warm up the drive and be ready. All right, putting more power into the engines. We're approaching supercruise velocity. I'm now matching the jump vector. On the front of the cockpit, a holographic marker highlighted their jump destination. We're aligned, Darius continued, activating frameshift drive. The powerful engine that bent space and allowing them to travel impossible distances wind and act into activation mode and then faltered. What the hell was that? Simeon demanded. He had never heard the frameshift drive sound like that before. I've no idea. Maybe we're still mass locked? No, we're clear. The system isn't showing up as mass locked anyway. It's reading an unknown error. Are we being interdicted? There's no sign of the device being used. Has it malfunctioned? Not that I can tell. I'm checking the di diagnostics now. I'll maintain course and get us further away from the belt. Maybe it's just a mass, mass lock malfunction. I really don't think it is. The computer isn't showing any error either. Still, no trace of an interdiction wave. Wait a second. Our friend's back. Scratch that. Friends. On the scanner, fresh contact appeared on the edge of the scanner range and divided into four. They're picking up speed, Simeon reported. OK, this stinks. Anything on the drive? Nothing. Should we go run back to the station? They'll be honest by the time we've turned around. You need to get that drive working. How? I don't even know what's wrong with it. The system just shows the same unknown error message. I think this is one of those times I wish we still had our Vipers. You and me both. All right, we're going to have to do this the hard way. You get on the comms and let them know we're in trouble. I don't like it, but we need their help, and they'll scramble their alert fighters. They're at least two hours away, Simeon pointed out. This thing's going to be over by then. Just get the word out. Maybe the planet's navy has something close by. On it. They will outrun us, but don't, make, but don't make it easy for them. I have no intention of it. I've got to get everything I can into the engines. On the scanner, the three nearest targets formed a loose line, ready to counter any escape event. Simeon thought that the fourth target looked larger, but he couldn't be sure. Free home station, this is two Vipers. We have unknown targets on the inner, inner edge of the belt. We could do with some help out here. Anything? No, you're on the same channel. Did you hear anything? Free home station, this is twin Vipers. Can you hear me? Nothing. Simeon cycled through the displays on the communications panel. The radio channels all registered intense jamming, and even the hyperspace channels reported no carrier wave. We have a problem here. I'd noticed what's going on with the comms. Everything is down. Everything? Even the hyperspace links? Everything. The laser system seems to be OK, but we don't have friendly friendlies near enough to align with. Could you relay something from the nav beacon? The navigation beacon still displayed brightly on the, uh, on the scanner, but the approaching ships would cut them off before they could get close enough. Probably, but only if we survive that long. That's the spirit. Sometimes Simeon wondered how much Darius missed their old lives. We can't stay out here, Darius continued. I'm heading back into the belts and see if we can get close enough to get the beacon to get a message through. All right. The nearest contacts have been resolved. We have three sidewinders on our tail. I can't tell what they're equipped with yet, but my guess is they'll be in weapons range in less than five minutes. What about the fourth contact? Nothing. 
He's keeping behind the sidewinders for now. He doesn't seem to be having any problems holding station, and they're coming in at full burn. Do you think they're after the cargo or us? They won't carry the most valuable car cargo in the galaxy, but it was still worth enough credits to be worth the heist. On the other hand, they'd also made some enemies over the years, and so it was possible that someone was after payback. We can dump the cargo and find out. Neither of them liked that option, since the cargo in the hold represented a major investment in their future for them. With the profit, they planned to upgrade to a larger ship, and a bigger ship not only meant bigger trades, it also meant a better appointed quarters while they were on long runs. However, losing the cargo would be a more palatable option than losing the ship. I guess we don't have a choice. As soon as you drop the cargo, I'll, help, I'll head back into the belt. It's not much, but at least we'll have a bit more cover. Dropping the cargo now. A string of cargo pods ejected in a loose line behind the ship. When the last pod dropped, Darius banked into a tight turn, and the main engines trailed exhaust crystals as they raced back towards the asteroid belt. Darius kept his attention on the ship's course while Simeon monitored the contacts on the scanner. They hoped the sidewinders would slow and scoop up the discarded cargo, and then they would all get on with their lives, poorer, but at least alive. They've ignored the pods and changed course, and they're following us in, Simeon reported. Damn it. Well, we're, we're not going to be able to outrun them. We can't fight them either, but we're going to have to try. Activating defensive systems. The, the Type 7 wasn't designed for combat, especially compared to the, vi the Vipers that they used to pilot. The three sidewinders would have stood a chance against two. Sorry, the three sidewinders wouldn't have stood a chance against two vipers, but the bulky freighter was another matter. Despite its disadvantages, the ship wasn't without teeth, and Simeon activated the four auto turrets. Although they were designed as point defences against missiles, they could at least engage the smaller ships. The turrets are online. I'll switch some power from the engines to them once the sidewinders are in range. He looked in at the, at the heat sink launcher. The all-out run from the initial contact had generated a lot of heat, and that gave him an idea. Maybe we can hide from them. Darius understood what Simeon intended, and he shrugged. Maybe it's a better option than running or fighting, so let's give it a go. He checked the scanner. We've got a small cluster of asteroids coming up. Maybe we could squeeze in between the close ones, get ready with the heat sink, and then launch on my mark. A tense minute passed as they charged towards the, the clump of asteroids. The three sidewinders chased after them. The fourth contact remained unresolved on the edge of their scanner range. Now, Simeon launched the heat sink. The glowing disc spun off into space, glowing hotter than the ship. In the same moment, Darius cut the engines and buttoned up the radiator vanes so that they could no longer emit any of the vast quantities of heat generated by the ship. They couldn't remain buttoned up for long, and ev as even in low power mode, the heat build up would quickly begin to damage the ship's systems. Darius feathered the thrusters, using as little power as possible to arc the ship between the massive asteroids. Simeon watched the sidewinders on the scanner. He hissed and relieved as, as they thundered past the asteroid and followed the heat sink. They've taken the bait. It won't fool them for long. I'll drift as long as possible. Keep an eye on them, and when they start to turn, we'll boost again and give them a new target to chase. What's the fourth contact doing? He's in the same pattern, bringing up the rear. We have two heat sinks left. We'll have to make them count. Stating the obvious wasn't Darius's most endearing trait. In fact, Simeon hated it, hated it. But he also knew that it was one of his lover's defense mechanisms. So he held his tongue and watched the contacts on the scanner. He also timed how long the diversion worked. If they could hide and sprint long enough to hold or build a decent gap between their pursuers, then maybe they'd get out of this. They're starting to turn. Darius reacted as Simeon spoke and poured everything the ship had into its engines. He opened the heating vents and the rear of the ship glowed as it dumped their excess heat. They see us, Simeon told his partner, how long until they reach weapons range? It's difficult to be sure, but probably, probably no more than 10 minutes. The tactic had gained them five minutes. Not much, but maybe enough if they could make the last two runs count. Let me know a minute before they reach weapons range. Will do. The 10 minutes burned by all too quickly. They're in, they're in range. Dump the next heat sink. Simeon launched their second heat sink as Darius fired the lateral thrusters, changing their course while hiding, hidden by the bloom of the heat sink. He shut the engines down again and buttoned up the ship so that they vanished once again from their pursuer scanners. They're not falling for it this time. Shit. One of the sidewinders has broken off and followed the heat sink. The other two are following our original course. They'll have us on visual at any moment. Damn it. Weapons lock, raising shields and activating turrets. Keep some power in the engines so I can manoeuvre. Put the rest in the shields, although I don't know how long they're going to last. 
Their shields hissed as the first Sidewinder swooped in, firing its burst lasers, burst lasers. The enemy hadn't expected the return fire from the defense turrets and had to take evasive action as its shields drained from the rapid laser fire. He'll be a bit more cautious on his next run, Darius quipped. I think they all will be. Look, the Sidewinders took turns to nibble at the Type 7 shields. They slit up so they could hit the evading freighter from different angles. They kept their distance as well, so the point defense has caused little damage. They don't seem to be in any hurry, Simon, Simeon remarked. That's what worries me, and I still can't raise anything on comms. We could try to surrender. Darius pulled a face in response. Yeah, well, I don't like it either, but we're going to have to get away from them. Those sidewinders can outmaneuver us easily, and they outgun us. And who knows what, other, what the other contact is. As if to reinforce this point, a fresh fusillade of laser fire slashed into the shields. The shields were already darkening around the ship. Both of them recognised that they weren't going to last much longer. <coughs> Darius swerved the ship, and the second burst missed by mere inches. He wasn't so fortunate with the third salvo. Damn it, you're right. We can't outfight them. Try contacting them with the laser comms. Simeon tapped on the communications console, aligning the type beam communication system with the still unresolved target. It looked further back from the more energetic sidewinders who continued their assault on the Type 7 shields. The laser pinged back, indicating that it located a receiver. The shields collapsed as the system initiated a handshake with the unknown ship. It all happened too slowly for Simeon as he willed the computer to work faster. As soon as the connection established, he spoke. Attacking ships, we surrender. Halt your attack. We surrender. The ship shuddered as laser fire smashed into the hull, their shields now fully collapsed. The connection indicator blinked off on the console as the unknown ship severed the connection. Missile lock, Darius shouted in concert with the alarm in the, in the cockpit. On the scanner, Simeon watched the unknown contact blossom into several smaller contacts that streaked towards them. Darius swung the ship in a tight turn, the two typhoids couldn't turn tightly enough, and the missiles tore the ship apart. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. Okay. Um, so um, I'm not going to, well, I'll, I'll do this from there because it's me next. Thank you. Right. Okay. So I mentioned that some of these books might be things that you've never heard of or, or things that haven't been published yet. So this would be an exclusive preview of The Death of Gods, which is chapter one, uh, well, this will be chapter one of the Chaos Reborn official novel, which for those of you that haven't played in the tournament yet today, we have another tournament tomorrow. It is well worth going and having a little game of being a wizard, summoning creatures, and beating the snot out of the other person. How did you get on that? John Stabler killed me in two turns. <laughs> With an eagle. Okay, so um, just to give you a little bit of a, a background to this, um, I was asked to essentially to write a story that would un allow players to understand where they got to the game premise, where they got to this fractured world, where they are wizards summoning all these, these type of creatures. And I made a decision very early on to center the origin of this in our real world. So this particular story is set in the 14th century, and we're going to look at chapter one, which is in AD 1307 and is entitled The First God Dies. Chapter one, The Old Blood. Looking back many times over the years, Piers Gaveston wasn't sure what woke him that night. A quiet footstep on the stair, perhaps, the inhalation of breath as, a figure as the figure raised the knife, a flash of moonlight upon the blade. He opened his eyes, reached up with both hands and caught the wrist of his would-be assassin, halting the point of the knife an inch from his chest. A man's arm in his grip and a man's purposeful stare held him in the moment. Complete silence between them as they struggled, neither wishing to wake the other inhabitants of the house, but for very different reasons. Two hands on the hilt of the weapon, strength and weight told. The knife descended, its point pricking the skin of his chest. Desperately, Piers changed tactics, shifting his leg and kicking out, turning in his small bed, rolling the man towards the floor. He gave a grunt of surprise and lost his balance, falling with a muffled thub. Thump. Thub. Terrible word. The blade clattered away. My lord, are you all right? 
a concerned voice from outside. Piers ignored it and leapt from the bed, driving a fist into his assailant's face and a bare foot into his gut. The man grunted again and made a grab for his ankle, but too late. Piers snatched up a pillow from the bed and dived at the window, head first. The wooden frame and glass shattered. For a moment, he was flying in darkness, then cold water assaulted him from all sides. He let go of the pillow and kicked out, holding his breath, staying underwater, swimming as fast as possible. His lungs burned, but as such, pain must be endured. He was of the old blood. He could withstand such mortal needs for a long time. A very long time. He thought of his wife and children still in the lodgings. They would be safe so long as he didn't go back. That meant leaving Sandwich, the small English coastal port town, and finding help. An hour after the attack, he swam up and raised his head from the water. He moved to a dark spot under the pier. He could see a gathering of shadows around the inn he'd fled from. Some would be genuinely concerned. Others would be looking to find him and finish him. Quietly, he swam in the opposite direction. Katia stared down at her brother. He was sat in his usual place at the table, but today held his head in his hands, weeping. She knew why. Father. The news wouldn't be good, so she hesitated before asking, her gaze straying from him, taking in their home and memorizing the details, as if she might never return. The gaps in the walls where the straw thatch peeked through, the black cauldron cook pot that steamed throughout the day, and the piles of blankets beneath where she slept with her sister. It was a hot spring afternoon, and flies intruded on their private moment. She turned, staring at the dividing wall. She could hear her mother murmuring in a gentle tone, accompanying her father's weakening breaths. Won't be long. She looked at Andre, her brother again, sat amid the empty, cha empty chairs, his shoulders quivering. She wanted to reach out and take him in her arms, but he would reject her touch. They all would, believing themselves sullied and unclean to her and her sister. She stared at her father's chair, remembering him there. The laughter and smiles were gone now and would remain empty, a hole in their lives that would never be filled. Finally, she summoned her courage and asked the question, how long? Andre glanced at her as if she were a stranger. Hours, maybe, he said. The apothecary says the pain is gone, but he won't last the night. Katia bit her lip. If I tried, no, he would hate you. They fell to silence, listening to the weak noises from the other room. Eventually, the emotion around her became more than she could stand, and quietly, Katia left the room, leaving her brother to his grief. She wandered down the thin road from the village towards the woods, keeping her eyes upon her feet as people passed. They moved aside, giving her room, even those who did not believe were wary enough to respect the superstition. Eventually, she found herself by the river at a familiar spot, and approaching the person she'd been subconsciously seeking, her sister, her twin sister, Galena, sat as always with a pile of washed clothes beside her staring into the water. Katia walked up quietly, no need to announce her presence. Galena always knew where she was. How is Andre? she asked, without turning from the water. I thought you want to learn about father. I know about father, Galena said. Katia nodded and sat down. She picked up a smooth stone and threw it into the water, disturbing it for an instant. Andre is in pieces. He wouldn't let me help. He was right to stop you. Galena spoke softly as if to someone else, then turned towards Katia. A heart-shaped face with thin lips, a mirror to her own, apart from the dark blue eyes and a tiny scar on her cheek from their first fight in the womb, Mother said. Katia blush brushed back her... Galena brushed back her brown blonde hair. Father would never forgive you. Katia frowned. She picked up another stone between a finger and thumb, concentrating. The magic came to life, a shivering thrill that ran down her arm. Gradually, her hand closed and her fingers came together, forcing a hole right through the middle of the rock. When she was done, she held it out. What's the point in this if I can't help the people I care about? Galena's gaze didn't waver from hers. Perhaps the power you have would aid them, but controlling it, she made a face. If he died at your hands, what then? At least I know I tried. And the village would know too. We have enemies. Those who do not believe as we do. You've heard their names for us. Witches, they say. If you give them an excuse, they will take us both far from here. She plucked the stone from Katia's hand and dropped it into the water. We must give them no reasons and do as father wished until the time is right. But when will the time come? Trust me, I will tell you. They sat in silence together for a while, both staring into the water. Katia trying to glimpse something of what Galena saw. She asked her about it. She'd asked her about it before, but never understood the answer. I see what passes, Galena had always said. It was a strange bond they shared. 
each with a power incomprehensible to outsiders. But the village elders claim them as gifts from heaven, which frightened Katya even more. She'd been told the stories, of course, how the old blood guided them and gave them a shepherd to bring them to the creator. The villagers believed the world to be made by evil and death, to be a final act to return to paradise, casting off the corrupt form of the flesh. Katya and Galina were supposed to be shepherds, the purest form of those born with the old blood. The village watched them closely when they were young and saw the signs. They wanted them to, married off at 14 summers, but so far their ailing father had persuaded them to wait another two seasons. We need to leave, Galina said, voicing Katya's thoughts for her and making her smile. It was a habit from childhood. As they grew older, the bond between them changed and became less distinct, but she still felt it. Where could we go, she asked. We have family and friends. Without them, we will be fine, Galina said. Mother and Andre will be better without us. She stood up from the river and began to gather the bundle of clothes into two piles, which she put into two large sacks. I brought everything we need, food enough for a few days. We'll take the road south to Viden. No one will notice us until nightfall. Katia watched her work. Don't you want to see father, she asked, to make your peace. I did that weeks ago, Galina replied. She held out one of the sacks. I'm sorry you didn't get the chance. Katia's hands curled into fists. You never told me you knew. Galina didn't reply, just held out the bag. With no fuel, Katia's anger ran out of her as quickly as it came. She took the sack wrapping the strap around her shoulders. You didn't tell me because you knew I'd try to help him, she said softly. Galena nodded and smiled sadly. There is nothing for us here, time to go. Without another word, both sisters fell into step towards the road. Yeah. Okay, oh gosh, blurry me. I didn't know that was there. That's quite frightening, isn't it? Goodness. Cheers, cheers for that, Grant. That's, that's you know, thanks. Bah. Um, okay, next up we have Ian Waits, and Ian is going to read from Pelquin's Comet. So, a uh, bit of science fiction, a bit of fantasy, a bit of science fiction. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. W H A T E S. Should be there. The, the website should be. Oh, we did put all the websites up. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right, well, whilst see, I get see, the technology I, sorted I, out. I set all of this up. You know, I did, you know, I, and then Foz decided to... We, we had Ian's website up. And now I decided, no, no. Well, whilst they sort out the technical side, I'll just get on with it. I don't care what's yeah, behind me. <laughs> um, yep. No problem. I'm going to be reading from Pelquin's Comet, which is um, my novel that came out about three months ago. Um, I, I, I have to congratulate the previous two readers, both of whom read from the beginning of the book. I'm going to break the tradition and go to the middle, because just what the heck. Um, essentially, Pelquin's Comet is, is a science fiction story which takes a traditional trope the idea that humanity has been bootstrapped to the stars using caches of alien technology. Um, it later completely subverts that trope and turns it on its head, but in the first book that's not so apparent. Um, the main ca characters in this are, has anyone ever seen a TV series called Firefly by any chance? Um, they, they were very much um, the inspiration. The idea is a small crew, very tight nipped, um, nipped, knit on, on a ship. They've discovered they believe they've discovered where there's a cache of alien technology. They go off to find it. To fund the expedition, they have to go to a, a merchant bank to raise the funds because it's an expensive business. Um, the merchant bank are convinced they stand a chance of actually having a profitable voyage, so they advance them the funds on condition they take an agent with them, one of the bank's agents to um, oversee and safeguard their interest. The agent, who's called Drake, is a lot more than he seems. He has a hidden past. He also has a strange furry pet called Mudball, who is in fact, in fact an um, alien intelligence who um, the two communicate telepathically, although the, main although, um, the rest of the characters don't know this. To Drake's horror, his past begins to catch up with him when the crew take on a new member, um, the ship take on a new member of crew um, called Lisa, who's somebody from his past, but 
Lisa is an amnesiac. She has no memory of her past at all, except when she sleeps and her past is coming back to him, her in broken fragments. So I'm actually going to go back to a bit that concentrates on Lisa, who was raised on a world belonging to an alien species called the Exters, where she grew up on a community who were studying the Exters in an environment that's not entirely um, suitable for humans. So they have to take certain um, augmentations in order to survive there. So this is Lisa remembering back to her past slightly. Tal had a different mother to her but they shared the same paternal quad. This didn't automatically make them bosom buddies or anything, but they did tend to hang around together. He never had been her best friend, too big, too loud, too brash, too keen to impress, but he was part of the gang, that the four or five or, or seven or eight of them who gravitated together. Tull was the one who always took things a step too far, as if to compensate for not quite being accepted to the same extent she was. If any of them were going to break something or, or fall off anything, you could bet it would be Tull. No, he was never her best friend, but the day he died it felt as if he was. They'd been playing in the gully, the shallow defile that ran in a ragged line to the south of the plateau on which Liaise, which is the name of her home, um, stood. Parents would have, been, would have disapproved of their being there, but generally turned a blind eye. After all, this was familiar ground, only a stone's throw away from home, and, and even the parents realised that kids couldn't be kept cooped up forever and needed to let off steam occasionally. It should have been safe enough. They, they'd all had the modifications by then, the implants that enabled their bodies to draw sufficient oxygen from the planet's frugal air and filter out the toxins and pollens and microbes that human metabolism couldn't cope with. The programme of modification didn't stop there either. The parents were constantly tinkering with genetics, tweaking what it meant to be human, so that, a generation, so that in a generation or so, the implants wouldn't be needed at all. The, the type of slow and costly adaptation that became untenable on a ma macro scale being made to work for a small, dedicated group. You great sass and bat, you'll get your cuckle caught on something if you're not careful. Lisa could hear Meg's voice as clear as day, shrill, excited and full of laughter. Meg always had been more impressed by Tull's antics than Lisa would have liked. It would serve him right if he did, Lisa said. Words that would come back to haunt her later, or rather the sentiment behind them would. Not that he's got a cuckle big enough to catch on anything in any case. Oh yeah, really? And how would you know that? More laughter. Tull was showing off by doing a series of split jumps over a row of low, knobbly rock formations, which resembled the gnarled stubs of half-burned candles made irregular by the flow of congealed wax. The final one looked a bit different, something that afterwards everyone claimed to have noticed, but no one had commented on at the time. It seemed newer, fresher. By the time Tull reached it, he was overbalancing a little and losing momentum. If he had any sense, he would have pulled out and, and given up on that last one. But no chance. This was Tull, after all. The jump was an ungainly one, lacking any real height, and his crotch caught on the tip of the final mound. He was laughing and doubtless anticipated a painful blow, as did the onlookers. But instead, the irregular top of the pile crumbled away. Not rock, then, at least not solidly so. Instead, it was formed of dust and earth and stuck together with goodness knows what. A nest, as Lisa would subsequently learn, a hive deliberately fashioned to mimic the prevailing rock formations as camouflage. Unprepared for the comparative lack of resistance, Tull did overbalance then, sprawling onto his hands and knees amidst a cloud of reddish dust, still laughing. The laughter choked off in an ow of surprise and pain. At first, Lisa assumed Tull's knees or hands were stinging for following the fall, but there was something odd about the dust he'd kicked up. Most of it had settled, but some still seemed to be moving, and not as she would have expected. It took her a moment to realise what was happening. What she'd taken to be dust was boiling out of the decapitated rock and flowing with apparent purpose towards him. Already, Tull's lower legs were covered in a red, writhing stain. Not a stain, this wasn't one single thing, but a multitude, a living carpet of tiny creatures moving with common purpose. Tull started to scream. Whether from pain or fear, Lisa wasn't sure. He leapt to his feet and jumped into the air, but still the mites found him, clung to him, bit him. Meg started towards him as if to help, but Zane grabbed her, thank goodness. Tull was cavorting around as if in a macabre, disjointed dance, an undignified, hot-footed jerk, body convulsing, arms shaking vigorously in an attempt to dislodge the mites, and the screams, definitely pain now, took on an air of desperation. They were unrelenting, 
and the most chilling thing Lisa had ever heard. Help me, he yelled. No one did, no one could. Even Meg had stopped trying to. Part of Lisa wanted to look away, felt that she should look away, but she couldn't. The mites continued to boil from the nest, rising in a red tide to engulf Tull's body. Someone else had joined in with the screaming. It was herself, Lisa realised. Tull's struggles lessened and then stopped altogether. He sank to the ground and, with only occasional glimpses of his skin or clothing visible, beneath a rising mass of ruddiness, it seemed as if his very body was melting. Zane still gripped Meg by the shoulders, though by then Lisa suspected more for his own comfort than to restrain her. Meg had begun to cry in fitful wails, her face contorted as tears spilled down her cheeks. Zane simply stared, ashen-faced. As she glanced across, Lisa saw movement beyond her two friends and instantly froze. As if things couldn't get any worse, an extra stood there, presumably drawn by the screams. Neither Zane nor Meg had noticed it as yet. Once they had, its presence did nothing to calm the situation. Meg's cries turned to hysteria. Her screams replaced Lisa's, who had lost the ability to give voice to anything. Meg scurried around the far side of Zane for protection, <laughs> as if puny little Zane could have protected her from a falling leaf, let alone this adult extra. The alien was all quick-legged movement. It didn't dart, but somehow Lisa had the impression that it was about to, all the time. It ignored them, scuttling towards where Tull lay cloaked in a blanket of crimson mites. One of the creature's forelimbs held a broad, nozzled object, which looked a bit like a cross between a gun and the business end of a hose. The alien pointed it towards Tull, and a jet of white liquid shot forth directly to where the red mites were at the thickest. The effect was immediate. The mites disappeared wherever the liquid touched, either dying or recoiling. Lisa couldn't sure be, be sure which. Within seconds, Tull was wholly visible again, the flat crimson limb of mites that had covered him, withdrawing back into the mound that spawned it. Tull lay twitching and spasming. Where exposed, his skin had puffed up and, and was blotchy, his face almost unrecognisable. Without hesitation, the alien scooped up the boy's form in its forearms, lifting Tull as if he weighed nothing, and then started towards Lies. Lisa did her best to keep up, but the extra's four-footed gait was far too swift for her. This was the first time she'd been so close to one of the aliens, and despite the way it moved, sending shivers up her spine, she was fascinated. The body wasn't segmented like an insect's, but the way it carried itself almost horizontal to the ground, and the arrangement of limbs suggested one. The face was dominated by multifaceted eyes, far more sensitive than a human's, and it was impossible to tell what it was wearing. She couldn't distinguish between clothing and skin. Exeter's normally walked using six limbs, though analysis showed that even then most of the body's weight was carried on the thicker middle and rear limbs, but they could swap seamlessly to a four-footed gait when carrying something, such as now. Lisa knew all this from lessons, but witnessing the real thing in motion was something else entirely. Making light of its burden, the extra negotiated inclines that the humans could never hope to attempt, and the alien was soon lost to sight despite their best efforts. By the time Lisa and her friends reached Liège, the whole settlement was alerted and on the case. She never saw Tull again. None of them did. Lisa learnt from Liat, her noon father, that despite the alien's haste, Tull had been dead on arrival, and there'd be nothing anyone could do to revive him. She further learnt that the extras called the mites that had killed him Red Dust, a name that needed no explanation. Red Dust was evidently a hide creature, a hive creature, aggressively territorial. Individually, individually each bite was relatively harmless. The implants carried by all the, of Liaise's citizens could have nullified the toxin in a matter of course, but the mites attacked in tens of thousands, biting all the while, and in Tull's case, the protection afforded by his implants was simply overwhelmed. Red dust had been eradicated from the area decades ago, but recent signs suggested a colony had established itself. The extra that helped them had been one of a number tasked with hunting down the infestation, but evidently it hadn't occurred to them to inform the human colony of a possible threat. Liat did his best to put a positive spin on events, telling Lisa that Tull hadn't died in vain, that he discovered the red dust nest, the red dust nest, and so helped to remove a serious threat. He went on to say that, Dull, that Tull should be considered a hero, but she wasn't buying it. Tull was simply a buffoon who tried to show off once too often. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
And finally, reading from his Amazon best-selling series. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they, they, they really didn't do you any favors here in the, in the, in the crew. In the, you know. I can see Grant was, was, was on that. Um, finally, reading from his excellently best-selling series, Human Legion, is Tim C. Taylor. Tim. Thank you. So uh, just to, uh, to ape uh, Ian, in fact, I'm going to read from the middle. So uh, just to set the scene, uh, the protagonist here is a 70-year-old, 17, not 70-year-old uh, marine cadet um, of the title. Um, it's set 500 years in the future. Uh, he's uh, effectively a, a bioengineered um, soldier slave, if you like, a cyborg almost, uh, who's a descendant of a million children um, sold into slavery with alien masters uh, 500 years earlier. Um, so he's gone to all sorts of hot water in the first uh, two parts of this book and he thinks he's just about escaped um, without any complications. Obviously he's wrong, but he doesn't realise that at this time. So he's, uh, he's back with his uh, training group and he's uh, going to, uh, he's partway through um, a training exercise in orbit and his, uh, his aim really is just keep his head down and uh, keep out of trouble. So let's see how he gets on. Oh, I should say, his, uh, there's a sort of human-AI symbiotic relationship with uh, their battle suit. So his, uh, his AI that he deals with, his name is Barney, <laughs> uh, which might be a 2000 AD reference. Uh, <coughs> okay. Aaron concentrated his thoughts on an area of space about one half click closer to Fort Dumont until Barney acknowledged adding a cream waypoint marker to Aaron's tack display. On my mark, three, two, one, mark. A blur of frantic motion erupted into the void from all directions, every cadet performing a crazy dance of perfect unpredictability. Aaron whooped with delight in the privacy of his own suit as he corkscrewed, reversed, accelerated and stopped in a complete jink out maneuver. All he had to do was set the waypoint and enjoy the ride as Barney plotted a, co a constantly changing evasive course. After about 10 seconds, Fort Dumont's point defense systems were activated, immediately acquiring targeting solutions. Lasers opened up, fingers of instant death reaching out to pluck the cadets from their dance. Aaron was under heavy fire, but it felt oddly unreal. It always did in space. With a grand assault, you felt the crump of shell fire through your feet and heard the whip lash crack of field railguns. Gu Atmospheric dust would bloom beam weapons into brilliant light shows, leaving a tang of ozone in the singed air and an afterimage on survivors' retinas. Not so in the serene vacuum of space. Here there were no shockwaves, the only sounds that of Aaron's own breathing and the commands coming through his internal helmet speaker. With no atmosphere to scatter their light, lasers were invisible unless you looked directly down the beam. Death was something that happened to someone else until it happened to you. And even then, any weapon capable of slicing through battlesuit armor would kill the person inside before they knew they'd been hit. There were no wounded in void combat. Barney gave him a jolt whenever one of the cadets was hit. In the disorienting rush of the assault, that was the only way he could tell the lasers were finding targets. Aaron hadn't time to worry about them. He set Barney a second waypoint closer to the ship. After another two seconds of exposing himself to point defence, Barney told him he was now two clicks from Fort Dumont. Aaron fired smoke. He'd made it through the most nerve-shredding part of the mission now. The defensive munition canister flew from the launcher beneath the barrel of his S-71 carbine. Moments later, the canister split into two, each section blasting off on different vectors. Those children split again and then again into a total of 64 final capsules. The assault force launched around 3,000 capsules in total, which exploded over the course of the next 20 seconds, lighting up the vacuum. Marines talked of firing smoke, but what really emerged was a mixed shower of decoys and material strips that unwound into streamers. The strips had a range of properties, highly reflective, thermally hot, radioactive, energy absorbent. All were designed to confuse enemy targeting systems and degrade beam strength, and it worked. Aaron sensed the rate of casualties slowed to a near stop. Space seemed to have acquired a thousand new stars, 
a sequin shroud added to by the enemy lasers, which flashed in green or red bursts from myriad reflections. Aaron told Barney to filter out these distractions from his visor, leaving him with the target ship and his waypoints. He was about to add a third waypoint when a gut-wrenchingly abrupt change of velocity grayed and narrowed Aaron's vision, robbing him of breath. It took a few seconds for Barney to ease his acceleration enough for the blood to start flowing properly in Aaron's head. As his vision returned, Barney explained that he'd made an emergency course correction to avoid colliding with another cadet. The AI was now bringing him directly to the target. The constant chinking grew even more frantic for a few moments before slamming to a halt. Barney had matched velocity with the target ship, positioning Aaron at the far left of his fire team's patrol arc. The suit was now stealthed too. Aaron tensed. If all went well, the smoke screen would have hidden his entrance, so that when the cloud of defensive munitions had degraded, Aaron could rely on his suit to keep him invisible. If the smoke hadn't hidden him enough, he'd already be dead. Aaron relaxed and looked around. Springer was in position to his right and Madge further on. If Osman had made it through, then he'd be further still, hidden by the curvature of the ship's enormous hull. Aaron gave Springer a thumbs up. She ignored him. He had a sudden urge to talk to her, but couldn't without breaking the training protocol. The only reason Aaron could see his body was because the stealth function on these training suits was only a simulation. If this assault were real, Springer would be as invisible to him as to the enemy. That and the point defense lasers would have opened up earlier and at lethal strength. Aaron looked over his section of hull. There were hatches aplenty and concealed areas under the forward shield projector where an enemy counter-strike force could assemble before attacking. There was nothing to report. He glanced down and aft to where most of the cadets in the assault force were already swarming over the boarding points, simulating breaching by holding a boarding patch to the hull and pressing down until the patch turned green. Only then could they jump through the pre-drilled holes into whatever awaited them. There was nothing he could do for the boarding teams now except guard them from surprise attack while they were busy. Aaron turned his attention back to Fort Dumont's bow. From a distance, the training ship was a sleek wedge of metal, but up close, the hull was much messier. The original hull design had been infected by a boxy urban landscape that had risen, been cleared away, and then rebuilt countless times over the centuries to leave heat exchanges, gun emplacements, storage lockers, shuttle docks, maintenance bot housing, and retrofitted defense munition launchers. If the blocky hull surface betrayed that Fort Dumont had never needed to cut through the thickness of a planet's atmosphere, the forward shield projector was evidence that it had to press through a far more deadly medium, interstellar dust and debris. From a human perspective, the void was a vacuum, but the gulf between the stars was not quite devoid of, of matter. And even a tiny dust particle would hit with the force of a fusion grenade when the ship slammed into it at its top speed of 0.7 light speed. The apex of the filigree crown of shield rails extended nearly two clicks forward of the bow. In flight, the shield rails charged the interstellar medium, rolling it around and along the ship's beams in a magnetic slipstream. Beneath Blue 5, the shield power array was laid out like a fan-shaped forest with its narrowest point aimed directly at the boarding point. If he were a defending officer planning to sally forth against marine attack on the upper hull, Aaron would deploy his counterattack through this forest, which consisted of scores of the 10-foot high spiny boxes that powered the two upper shield projectors. Then he'd wipe out the boarding teams, taken by surprise. Aaron hung above the parrot away, uh, array, screwing up his eyes as he tried to penetrate the crimson-tinged black shadows cast by the light reflected off Antilles, the nearest of Tranquility's moons. When the cadets had launched their attack on the orbiting ship, they had kept the cover of, the tran of Tranquility's shadow. For this simple exercise, Fort Dumont's belly had been oriented towards the planet's surface, which shrouded the upper deck in that same shadow. Aaron switched to infrared, but the power array was partially charged, meaning it glowed bright blue in his visor. Looking for the bots in infrared was like looking for a flashlight on the star surface. It was no good. He switched back to the visual spectrum, but despite all the augmentations that uprated his sight and Barney's best efforts to refine the image in his visor, all Aaron could see were shades of black. He tried forcing his brain to concentrate harder. He couldn't afford any more mistakes. One more volley up and Sarge, Staff Sergeant Bryant would kick him back down to the Orcs levels, which is where he doesn't want to go. Alerting his section to an attack that wasn't there would be enough to earn that kicking. But the harder he made himself peer into the dark, the more it shimmered, his mind imagining fleeting patterns that weren't actually there. What he needed were the sensors in his suit, but he was running his systems cold. Actor sensors would give away his position, so he left his eyes unfocused, relying on the natural motion detection ability. 
Contact, Blue 4 going firm. The warning came from Mizzy Sesse. Aaron had been good friends with Busy, close enough to hear the worry beneath his seemingly calm voice. 18 hostiles, bearing 350, range 120 metres. Busy's voice cut off, but that didn't mean he was dead. By broadcasting his warning, he had also revealed his location underneath the ship. Busy could be moving to a new position, the G-forces unleashed, squeezing off his ability to speak. Alice's voice came over the command channel. Gold 4, peel left. Gold 5, peel right. Enfilade hostiles in contact with Blue 4. The temptation to turn and watch the action threatened to wrench Aaron's head around, but he had his orders and they hadn't changed. Checking what was going on elsewhere in the battle was Madge's responsibility. Instead, he settled back into his watchful gaze. Gold Command has boarded, said Alice. Brant has secured the upper two decks. I'm forming up for attack on target one. Gold 3, follow Gold 6. Remain stealth, there's reserve. Blue 6, maintain position. Let's show those vets what we can do, Marines. Aaron's confidence lifted further when Busy reported over the command channel that the enemy counterattack had been repulsed with minimal casualties. Aaron sensed victory, but only for a few seconds. Down there, in the shield generator array, he thought he saw movement. He strained his eyes, trying to tell whether this was an attack, but he couldn't be sure. He had to get nearer. To remain in stealth mode, albeit simulated, his suit could only move slowly. Aaron approached the suspicious area as fast as he dared, snapping a flash bomb off the equipment patch in his hip and slotting into the launcher beneath his carbine. Directly below him, hatches had opened in the hull, spilling hostiles into the cover of the shield array generators. The enemy were scurrying spider-like training bots, the size of a human child but with lasers attached to two of their limbs. A fist-sized plate was grafted onto the central body of the robots. If you hit that with your laser, the robot would deactivate, a combat casualty. Already he could see dozens. More were spilling out by the second, forming up ready to rush the boarding party. The counterattack on Busy had been a feint intended to commit the cadets' reserves. Should he warn the others? He readied his carbine to fire the flash bomb at the bots, but he didn't reveal his presence by broadcasting a warning as Busy had done. Instead, he asked Barney to find a tight beam comm route. Although he could turn around and see Springer, the stealth training protocol meant Barney pretended she was invisible. The AI simulated firing a tight beam pings at the probable location of his comrade, hoping to strike it lucky before being noticed by the enemy. Hold fire, McEwen. Activate local battle net. McEwen, uh, sorry, Madge had found him first, bouncing her order off Springer's suit. The instant Aaron switched to local battle net, Barney changed Aaron's visor to tactical display mode, adding five blue dots to indicate the positions of his section comrades. Delta section should have seven other cadets. Brandt had been promoted out. It looked like Zug hadn't made this far. LBNet continuously connected everyone in the team using tight beam links. It was risky, but more secure than broadcasting on wide battle net. With the suit IA now able to share what the wearers could see and add what the AI suspected, scores of enemy red dots erupted like an infestation over the terrain below. Hey Springer, Aaron called out. Join me at the hatch. We can drop grenades in and then take the bots from the rear. Negative, Madge replied, assigning orders. As Barney sketched an outline of Madge's intentions, Aaron scooted off to comply while Madge used words to duplicate her orders. The shield generator array was a funnel aimed at the boarding point, but the funnel drained between a pair of shield array projectors. The shield rails that charged the interstellar medium fed out those 30 meter diameter tubes, which are pointed forward, angled toward the starboard and port bows. Each of the two delta section, delta section fire teams would take a position on top of a shield projector. And when the bots passed below, the gold fire teams at the boarding point would pin them down and then delta section would rake the bots with flanking fire. It was obvious, although he hadn't seen it, and that was why Madge was section leader. By the time Aaron was in position, lying prone atop the starboard shield projector and using the ridge that ran along its crest as cover, Barney was telling him the bots were already beginning to swarm on the other side of the projector. The temptation to stick his head over the ridge to see for himself was powerful, but the fear of screwing up the operation was greater. He glanced to either side. Osman and Springer had rolled onto their sides, checking their flanks for bots. They appeared calm, but of course it was impossible to be sure in the training suits. He turned back to face the enemy. Blue dots showed Madge, Delmarie and Christina on the reverse slope of the other projector. The two fire teams keeping in touch by means of signal repeaters slapped over the ridges. One of the blue dots moved up the slope. It was Madge. Ready on three, she said. Simultaneously, the red dots rearranged and firmed as Barney received an update on their position. The bots fired first, not at Delta section, but at one of the teams at the boarding point. 
Contact, screamed Lance Corporal Yoshioka from Gold 3. They're coming at us from behind. She sounded surprised. Why wasn't Yoshioka in on Madge's plan? But there's no time to worry about Yoshioka. Madge counted down. Three, two, one, now. Aaron raised his carbine over his head and fired his flash bomb. Without waiting for its effect, he scrambled over the ridge and opened fire with his laser. Barney applying a charge to his suit that glued it to the projector on a rough approximation of standard gravity. Barney was ready for the explosion of light from the flash bomb, limiting its effect to be merely dazzling. To the bots, though, they acted stunned, which was perfect. Aaron raked him with laser fire. From the feet of his first target, he played his aim diagonally up to the right and then down again, stitching a repeating pattern of simulated death. There might be bots, but they still acted confused, staring up, seeking for the hidden threat that was scything them down. This was the therapy he needed. He tried to imagine he was shooting Torfik and they're scanning at magic monkey bitches. Inspected Nalapo for trying to get him executed to save her butt. Ceasefire? Oh, so soon. The feeling had been too good for Aaron to release the pressure on his trigger, but the thermal cutout on the carbine obeyed Madge's order anyway. There was movement there from the heap of robot bodies. He froze. No, no, but they were dead. The bots, he'd seen them fall. The combat bots rose from death, picked themselves up on spindly limbs. One rotated its bulbous sensor node and looked straight up at Aaron. It didn't even pick up its weapon, it just stared. Aaron scrambled back behind the projector ridge. Corp, but too late. His warning died with his comms connection. Stiffened cords erupted over his suit, immobilizing him. Barney wasn't there any longer, and the AI had taken his tactical display with him. That look from the bot had killed him, Aaron was certain, but that was impossible. The charge on his suit that had stuck him to the ship went too, and as momentum from Aaron's backward scramble carried him off the shield projector, his boots snagged briefly on a cooling fin, transforming his feet-first reverse into a head-over-heels tumble away from the warship. He bumped into a laser emplacement and off into space at the speed of an arthritic worm. The veterans would be in no hurry to resurrect the dead cadets after the exercise which left Aaron with more time than he wanted to ponder how Delta Section had messed up so badly. But his answer wasn't long in coming. Delta Section hadn't screwed up at all. The exercise had been sabotaged. Doubts gnawed at him, growing stronger as his distance from the ship stretched ever further. Until now, he'd dodged the clutches of the conspiracies swirling through Detroit. He'd begun to feel as if he were acting out a daring tale of adventure, something he would look back on one day and laugh but no longer. Although his body was tumbling helplessly through the vacuum, he knew his fate was held fast by the traitors, gripped as surely as by a powered gauntlet. There would be no human legion now. Yes. Great, thank you, Tim. Okay, so that essentially concludes things for the presentations in here for now. Uh, I believe, Grant, we are back in here at midnight, are we? Or are you doing, are you doing Dockers in here? Excellent, okay, so we now have the ability to go off and socialize, enjoy yourselves, and thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>